Thank you very much. This is my uh, potential conflict of interest slide. Uh, and I, I'll mention uh, people that I'm really thankful to along the way, the students and postdocs, and their pictures will be in here. I, I'm, I'm giving a talk tomorrow, and, so, and I've been told that some people might want to go to both. So I've tried to make as less than 10% overlap between the two talks, for what, for what it's worth, in case you do want to go. Uh, so this one will tend to avoid topics of, of personal genomics and precision medicine, although I'm quite interested in those topics. As you, um, so I'm going to focus more on some of the stuff we do on model organisms and basic enabling technologies for reading and writing, not just reading and writing genomes, but reading and writing biology. And you'll see what I mean by the distinction in just a moment. So here's probably our most aggressive uh, rewriting of a genome. This is, uh, I think, one of the first truly genome scale changes in an organism, not a copying of an organism, but actually changing it. Uh, so we're changing all of the codon, or all examples of one out of the 64 codons. We've published that and various uh, papers that have come from that. And then we're now, we're getting close to finishing seven out of 64 codons genome-wide. So this, this is truly radical redesign, and uh, it's the consequence is, I mean, you have to do it very carefully because the, the more you change the genome, the more likely you're going to break it. So if you just make a whole new genome uh, from first principles, it almost certainly will be broken for a hundred different reasons, and it'll be hard to hunt them down. So we do a combinatorial exploration that we'll see in a moment. But first you want to ask why. Why do this? Uh, why change the genome radically? And we have four pretty good reasons here, I think, which is uh, we greatly uh, improve the ability to use non-standard amino acids. This, these date way back, but we've now made them uh, very efficient to be used and use multiple ones per protein. Um, and then we have this uh, genetic and metabolic isolation, which we think are useful because of item number four, which is this multivirus resistance. In principle, we can make a, a version of E. coli or, or possibly any organism which is a priori resistant to all viruses, even viruses you haven't studied yet. And the reason is that viruses expect a, a certain genetic code. And uh, they don't have that much else in common, but they do have that in common. And so if you can change the genetic code adequately, then you become multivirus resistant. Now, a multivirus resistant uh, synthetic organism is one of the few laboratory artifacts that could survive in the wild. I mean, it couldn't only survive, it could thrive. Most things that you make in the lab, if you put it in the wild, like, you know, it's going to disappear very quickly. But this is an exception, and that's why we spent some time on genetic and metabolic isolation, uh, as represented in these science and nature papers. Now, this is, uh, this is work from our collaborator, Pete Schultz, and, and uh, over many years developing all these non-standard amino acids. I've circled the one that we, which has two phenyl groups in it called BIP-A. That BIP-A we used as part, as, uh, as arbitrarily chosen as one that's fairly bulky and uh, allowed us to make this genetically and metabolically isolated strain. This is, uh, we didn't expect that first codon on a 64. It's just a stop codon. It's a kind of a wimpy, rare codon. We didn't expect it to have a big impact on phages, but in fact, it, it uh, it reduced the infectivity by about three orders of magnitude for both lambda and T7, the two phages that we studied in detail. Uh, so it's, it's really pretty impactful on, on all the, the phages we've looked at so far. The seven changes we're making, seven codons out of 64, uh, we expect to be completely impactful. That is to say, there will be no viral growth and no way of escape. That's our bold prediction. Now, this is how we de-risk it combinatorially. Like I said, if we just made the genome and hoped for the best, it wouldn't, probably wouldn't work. So we have to make uh, thousands of genomes, and along the way, we learn all of the, the problems. Um, in fact, we've, for other experiments, not this one, we've made billions of genomes uh, combinatorially for optimizing metabolism. But this story here is about ch making a specific set of codon changes. So the one codon genome-wide actually had very few real problems other than working out the technology. But when we did the two codons that for arginine, uh, these are rare arginine codons, AGA and AGG, 
then we found about 12 cases where there were problems. And we expected this to be the most problematic of the codons because they look a little bit like uh, uh, Scheindel-Garnel ribosome binding sites. And, uh, and so either removing them or creating them is problematic. And then we went on to do 13 codons genome-wide in 42 essential genes and found lots and lots of, every place where there's a gray bar means some, where we had trouble uh, doing that ag aggressive recoding. Actually, we recoded every codon we could recode, so it was more like 32 codons, but 30, 13 were completely eliminated. Now, uh, so once we had that, f that one codon genome-wide, we wanted to uh, make it, not only make it be able to use a new amino acid, but to become completely dependent on that amino acid the way it is for the 20 that already exist. So there's, it's, it would be very hard exercise to make E. coli or any other organism so that it didn't require, say, tryptophan or tyrosine or any, any, of the, any of the amino acids. So we wanted to make this amino acid, BIP-A, in that category. And so we went through uh, about a uh, half dozen essential genes. Actually, we went through all the essential genes for which we had crystal structures, which was about 128, um, and then looked at every amino acid in every, uh, each of those crystal structures for something where we could substitute in BIP-A, making accommodating uh, choices all around it. So this is a big combinatorial problem. It was all done uh, using uh, computational tools uh, like Rosetta. Dan Mandel was in charge of the, of the computational and structural biology, and Mark LaJoy was involved in the genome engineering. Barry Stoddard and Rio were, uh, uh, helped with the crystallography. Now, this is crystallography of one of the half dozen essential genes we engineered. And you can see uh, this uh, uh, leucine residue we're going to change into BIP-A. And so there it is, uh, change to BIP-A. You can see these two phenyl groups. And this is the, the crystal structure, um, electron density, it's the cage, and it's a good, uh, it's a high quality structure that shows the BIP-A is as we modeled it to be. But more importantly, we did it in a number of different um, genes here shown along the bottom. And once, and we wanted to look at escape rate because each of, each of these, uh, to be truly dependent upon the amino acid, there can be no escape at any reasonable population. And, th and this is still a work in progress, but we showed that once we get to three, three essential genes simultaneously, uh, there's, we, we could not scale up to a big enough experiment where we could detect any escapes. So this is about one, less than one per trillion, zero, essentially zero detected per trillion so far. But we're working on new protocols where we might be able to detect uh, escape. Uh, but, but, but both our group and Farron Isaac's group at Yale um, uh, have shown that this one in a trillion is the current escape rate. And the NIH guidelines talk about 10 to the minus 8, not 10 to the minus 12. But in fact, I don't think anyone's ever achieved 10 to the minus 8 before. Uh, so we now have something that's very convincing. These are the, in blue are the seven codons we're currently uh, changing genome-wide. So the, one, the first one we changed is this one, there's uh, UAG, which is the um, uh, amber stop codon. And then, uh, and now we're changing a leucine, a serine, and an arginine pair of uh, codons because transfer RNA is typically recognized pairs. And then we can, only after we've changed them genome-wide can we delete the transfer RNA or the le release factor that otherwise would be essential. We've now synthesized the entire four megabase pairs and have uh, assembled uh, huge parts of it into 50 KB and replaced parts of the genome with a 50 KB. And we're discovering things along the way, just like with the AG, G and AGA codons that we have to fix uh, case by case. But it's not too bad and it's going pretty quickly. Now that's E. coli. And we hope that we can make uh, other organisms virus resistant. I'd like to be virus resistant myself. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but to do that, we need a, we need a new mechanism because the, the methods we use for this, which I didn't go through because they're not general, the, the methods we use for this is the lambda red system. And so far, it works in one organism, E. coli K12. It doesn't even work in E. coli B. Uh, so, um, and so any time you just, and, and all, these, all these methods 
ultimately come from microorganisms, all the recombinases and the, and the um, uh, nucleases and so forth come from microorganisms. And it's hard to predict in advance whether it's going to just work in one strain of one species or whether it's going to work in every organism. This is an example of something that came from E. coli called CRISPR, which probably doesn't need any introduction. I'm not even going to ask. Um, but it, was, it, it looked kind of like junk DNA in 1987. And now what happened is uh, this did work in basically every organism that you can get DNA into or RNA. Um, so starting with human w was, oddly enough, the first uh, <clears throat> non-bacterial organism. And then boom, with, from January 2013, uh, within a few months, it was in all these other organisms. And so uh, this is, uh, you know, you all know how it works, but basically you've got a, a collaboration between protein and RNA using simple Watson-Crick base pairs over 20 base pairs, plus a little PAM divided by the protein, two, two Gs. And you get this triplex, and you get either a double-strand break, or you can make it a single-strand NIC, or you can make it no NICs at all. We call that DCAS9 or DEADCAS9, or, and, uh, and that can be used for activation and repression. And so I think this merits a quote from Jacques Manaud uh, in the year that I was born. Anything found to be true of E. coli must also be true of elephants. Uh, as it turns out, elephants did not have CRISPR. Um, so I had to add this little note. Uh, if not, uh, we can make it so. And so we have now made it work in elephants uh, and uh, Anopheles mosquitoes. More about that in a moment. But more importantly uh, than getting it in all these organisms was getting it to be more specific. And there's uh, quite a few uh, breakthroughs from many labs on making it more specific. It seemed like people obsessed about the specificity of CRISPR much more than any other. I think that's a a good casualty of uh, having something everybody likes. Um, they have to complain about something. And so uh, as it happened, while we were complaining, we were also fixing it. So the, I think the main way is making dimeric nucleases, where you require two CRISPR binding sites, two 20 mers to be right near one another, either a fixed distance or, or, or a, a variable, slightly variable one. Truncated guide RNAs sometimes work pretty well. And most importantly, we have uh, better and better theoretical and empirical searches. It, it's cheap enough that you can really carpet bomb the whole region and find the ones that have the highest efficiency and the lowest off-target. So you're not entirely dependent on um, theory. So let's go through a few applications of this now that we, some of them utilize that, very few of them actually utilize that high specificity yet. We're working on pigs in my lab, uh, among others. You, uh, and this, they can be humanized for uh, testing therapies, or they can be used for xenotransplantation, or uh, in, in uh, agricultural situations to lower the infection and hence uh, transmission of viruses from um, pigs to humans. Uh, so at the top, these are some of the genes that we've been working on. At the top are a bunch involved in immune major immune antigens, including carbohydrates, uh, the blood cl clotting and complement system. And one of the big showstoppers at the, in the early days of this was uh, uh, Novartis spent about a billion dollars uh, making humanized pigs for xenotransplantation. And they kind of started phasing it out when they realized that there were dozens of endogenous retroviruses. Almost all vertebrates have these endogenous retroviruses. And they didn't even know how many there were. So they had, no, they had a beautiful timeline for all the rest of the project uh, for, you know, another, insert another billion dollars and they'd have it. Uh, but they had no timeline for counting or deleting these re endogenous retroviruses. We've now counted them and there's 62 that are plausibly have active components. Um, and we have now, um, with CRISPR, uh, simultaneously removed all 62 um, for less than a billion dollars. We, we actually spent 14 days on it. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and then that we're also interested in a number of other, those are endogenous viruses, and then here are uh, several exogenous viruses, not to mention swine flu. And what's at stake are uh, hundreds of thousands of people that are on the waiting list for transplants, and we tend to uh, underestimate that because there are many people who who are un were just not even put on the waiting list because they're too old, 
or for some other reason um, because it's all rationed. Now, this is a map of the malaria belt, and the malaria belt has consequences for human genetics, which I'm not going to talk about right now, but I will tomorrow, um, where, where you'll actually get an enrichment for alleles in uh, G6PD, hemoglobin S, and thalassemia. They're, about, they're over 2 billion people, 2.8 2 billion people that are impacted uh, by these alleles, um, which are deleterious in their own right, but they do protect them from malaria. So the alternative to messing with the human genome is messing with the uh, malaria uh, or, the, or the vector that, that uh, carries it. So we proposed uh, a couple of strange articles uh, where the, we were focused on not just proposing technology, but proposing technology that would provide safety features during the development phase in the lab and then additional safety features um, when released into the wild because this is pretty aggressive uh, technology in terms of uh, release into the wild. We published this in Science and eLife. eLife has more of the technical details. That's why it's featured here on this slide. And this was a, a collaborative effort between uh, Kevin Esfelt, uh, a, a fellow and a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Andy Smidler, who's a joint graduate student between my lab and Flaminia Catarucci's lab at the Harvard School of Public Health. And this idea of gene drives goes back uh, to, uh, I worked with Bernard Dijon during my thesis, and he noticed it in yeast, and uh, Austin Burt proposed it, in, uh, so that was back in the 70s, and Austin uh, Burt proposed it in 2003 for use in eliminating uh, mosquitoes, but you can see it can be used for essentially any sexually re reproducing species that reproduces fast enough, um, not just disease vectors, but uh, invasive species and, and various pests. So for example, rodents are are endangering many species on, on about 700 islands. About 100 of these islands have been made rodent-free by uh, toxic chemicals, but that strategy doesn't scale well to the other uh, 700 islands uh, because of uh, if, you have any, if it's a large island or if you have uh, other animals on it that you don't want to die. So this is how uh, CRISPR wor works in the gene drive. We target... Uh, a, a typically an essential gene, and not just with one CRISPR, but with six or so different CRISPR uh, guide RNAs. Of course, they each have the same uh, Cas9 protein, and then they make these cuts, um, and now you've got this, you've shredded the, the, that essential gene, and the, and the only way that it will survive, either whether this is a somatic cell or a gamete, will survive is by popping, is replacing that essential gene with this whole cassette, which includes the, the guide RNAs, the Cas9, um, and other markers, and in this case, a, a package, which in this case is an anti-malaria transgene, but it could be anything. So there's a variety of, of uh, proteins that are known to be toxic to malaria uh, that, are, that are kind of selectively neutral to the mosquito, but they're very advantageous if you can convince the mosquito to take them up. Now, so then, so then now this makes it work again and, uh, and you've turned a heterozygote into a homozygote. Now we tested this, uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment all the, all the various safety methods, but, uh, but here's an example one where, <clears throat> where we tested it in yeast, and uh, we're using yeast tetrads, uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, you, you expect in a yeast tetrad, the ad gene here, uh, uh, this red, white uh, adenine metabolism, to segregate two to two. Um, but um, which is normal Mendelian behavior, and it's, and it's not really stochastic. It's, it's a strict two-to-two -two segregation. But when we uh, put the gene drive in there, um, where the only way it can, that, that the other allele can survive the cutting is by, uh, by duplicating the gene drive. Now, this is not a typical tra transposon. Transposon would hop all over the genome and make a big mess. This only goes in one place in the genome that's predetermined and you can make it uh, the, uh, very uh, attractive, that is to say, by targeting an essential gene. But anyway, through many, many uh, of these, it's very, very close to 100% uh, rather than 50% that you expect of, of Mendel. So, uh, and that's not just true for a lab strain. We took uh, a wide variety of strains on this phylogenetic tree of wild yeast strains, and they all gave um, 
99 plus percent. So we tested the gene drive, we tested variations on it, safety variations where, for example, we would separate the Cas9 from the CRISPR, so rather than putting, sorry, the guide RNA from the protein, uh, so that the so only the guide RNA is transmitted in the, in the gene drive, and that's a safety feature, so that way if it ever gets out, uh, uh, the guide RNA and the Cas9 are not on the same cassette. So in the wild, you won't have Cas9 around, you'll only have the guide RNA and it won't won't spread in the wild. So we proposed in this eLife paper, uh, and have now proven um, a variety of these things. In the lab, uh, physical, ecological, and biological isolation, that thing I just showed you of keeping the Cas9 separate from the guide RNAs is a biological or genetic isolation. Um, uh, there are other things that you can do to, to, to keep it uh, under control genetically. But the ecological one is a really great one. Physical one is obvious. You, you do it in a containment facility. But ecological is if you do an experiment on, say, a flying insect that that's, uh, has a broad range, like Drosophila, uh, it, uh, if it escapes from your lab, it essentially can go, your gene drive can go throughout the world. Now, this is not necessarily an existential risk, but uh, it does look a little sloppy to have your fingerprints all over every fly in the world. Uh, um, but if you, if you do something like Anopheles gambii, which is what we're working on at the Harvard School of Public Health, there are no Anopheles gambii outside of the Harvard School of Public Health, and so that's an example of ecological isolation. Um, if you're interested uh, in really drilling down on the CRISPR, most of the software in the world is focused on specificity, um, and, I, and I told you all the things that you can do to improve specificity, but most of them, uh, software assumes just a simple CRISPR, cutting at one site rather than pairs of CRISPR. Um, and they also don't focus so much on efficiency. So one way of achieving specificity is by, uh, you can either attack uh, computationally the off-target, or you can look at the efficiency of the on-target. So anyway, take a look at these uh, two websites for some of the software. And then, oh, and then the GA is not just about specificity and efficiency design, but also analysis of the, of the CRISPR once you have it. Now, uh, m most of the experiments we do on, on uh, one of our favorite model organisms is Homo sapiens. And, uh, and in this, uh, we had, it's a, it's a special set of, uh, of consenting uh, issues, which I'll talk much more about tomorrow. Um, but, Suffice it to say, we have the world's only open access cohort, the cohort which has agreed to uh, do all kinds of things, get, recon get recontacted, have all their data, medical uh, and uh, genomic, uh, <coughs> available to everyone, not just um, people that we have deemed suitable. Uh, so it's like Wikipedia. It's really very close to Wikipedia in many ways. And the, we have stem cells for them, which have been differentiated into almost every kind of cell through teratomas here, neuronal rosettes. And also we have uh, focused efforts on making um, hippocampal and other organoids. Now, so we can use these, PG, our favorite is PGP1, uh, which happens to be my uh, stem cells um, from my arm. Uh, and, uh, and that's just because you, you don't want to do experiments on your students because that's considered coercive by the, <laughs> by the uh, <clears throat> agencies that decide on the ethics. But it's okay for them to do experiments on me. So that's what we do. And uh, anyway, here's an example where we use, uh, this is the dead cast ion. This, is, this has no cutting activity, but we've tacked onto the C-terminus a VP64 uh, activation domain. And then we can use this to program anything. We happen to pick here uh, uh, part of a, we're collaborating with David Sinclair's lab on, on aging reversal. And w one of the many different pathways for aging reversal um, is this uh, TFAM, which is involved in regulation of, uh, of mitochondrial homeostasis, and in particular nicotinamide levels. And you can see that here that over, no norm, quote, normal mouse aging from a, uh, from a young six-month-old mouse to an old 22-month uh, mouse, that the nicotinamide goes down by a factor of two. So we want TFAM to go up probably by a factor of two, depending on linearity. 
So uh, back in the old days, before we had that awesome software I showed you in the previous slide, um, the old days being uh, four or five months ago, um, which is a long time in CRISPR years, uh, we, we didn't really know how to predict sites very well. So we would, and, and this is still not a bad strategy, we just hit every site we could hit in the promoter of this TFAM regulator, so it's a transcription factor. So you're regulating the regulator and you're creating um, these, uh, in this case, four different cis regulatory elements. These are not naturally occurring cis regulatory elements. You've made them into cis regulatory elements because they bind the 20 nucleotide uh, guide RNA. This is transcription start site on the far uh, right here. Um, and it turns out that only one of these is decent. All the rest are pretty pathetic, less than uh, a one-fold <laughs> improvement. Uh, so uh, this one is a 47-fold improvement in the, in the uh, expression of the TFAM and about a nine-fold improvement in the NAD, which was more than the two-fold that we needed. But you know, we can, we can pat ourselves on the back about this, but the fact is that for many experiments, 47-fold activation is not enough. For example, a lot of the epigenetic reprogramming of stem cells into organoids that we're doing, 47-fold um, is, is definitely not enough. And I think we have an example of that. This is Bobby Dadwar, who's a, a postdoc in the lab who did this uh, TFAM and various other aging reversal. So that VP64 domain was not enough to get, to get a high activation for any of the genes that we did. So we systematically went through all the known activation domains in various combinations and numbers and orders. And we ended up with one with a really nice acronym, which is VIPER, VPR, for the, in, uh, the first initial of each of the domains. And uh, although that was also the optimum. Uh, that we found. And, and you can see that, for example, here's Titan, which is a, a beautiful, as the largest uh, protein coding region in the human genome, or um, it's uh, about 100 kilobases just for the cDNA alone. So it's not something that's super easy to fit into a viral vector, like our favorite viral vector is adeno associated virus, which uh, starts choking it around in four kilobases. But anyway, you don't need to because you can regulate it 20,000 fold with Viper as opposed to about uh, 36 fold, which is not even significant with VP64 alone, 63 fold. And you can do four at once, so you can he see here's Viper with four different genes at once. And like I said, it really was, VP64 is not adequate for, our, for many of our experiments where we were reprogramming um, different cell types. So here's NGN, a reprogramming of, of, uh, from ES cells to neurons more about that in just a moment. And this is Alex Chavez and Jonathan Scheinman and Sue Vora who developed the Viper system and applied it to neurons. You know, we've been working on getting DNA off of chips. Uh, the chips were originally developed to make a nice orderly array of DNA and, and we did uh, our usual blasphemous thing, which was we stripped the DNA off of these ordered arrays which didn't seem very logical at first, but it, it actually opens the doors to making libraries and even uh, large genome constructs. So all the, when I mentioned the four megabase E. coli genome that we synthesized, that was all done from DNA on chips. Um, the cost is down around 10 to minus four um, dollars per base. So it's uh, quite, quite affordable, but it's hard to get it. It's, is the cost starts going up when you start getting the synthesizing genomes. We can use these chips to look at cis regulatory elements. Now these are naturally occurring cis regulatory elements, not the artificial ones I was talking about in a moment, for both uh, <coughs> RNA and protein. And I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but if you're, if you're interested, we have a PNAS and a science paper on this. But where we use uh, uh, fluorescent proteins, one is the control and one is the one that's influenced by the cis regulatory elements. Uh, to measure the protein, and then we just use RNA-seq for the RNA. So we use what we call flow-seq, so for fluorescence-activated sorting, where you get this huge dynamic range for the one that's regulated and a very tight control for the non-regulated fluorescent protein, and you take the ratio. And so you can do tens of thousands of, of these cis-regulatory constructs, many combinations at once. So you're not limited to doing a simple library. One of the themes of our lab now is trying to look at 
you know, really complex combinations. Uh, I showed you one at the beginning with the four megabase synthesis. And this is one with cis regulatory almost regulating RNA and protein that, that overlap in various interesting ways. And just as an example of something that was a little surprising to us at least, although I later found out that one of my ex postdocs had predicted this theoretically, um, <coughs> uh, Sahi Pilpel had uh, predicted this, uh, but uh, I didn't know about it. Anyway, we, we found out that, that in contrast to the dogma that rare codons were associated with low protein expression, both, both naturally and cause and effect, and, and, and common codons with, with high expression, it turns out at the very beginning of genes, it's the opposite. So the rare codons are the ones that are uh, most enhancing of expression in a causal way because we're doing these constructs. Uh, and um, and it's not a trivial consequence of, of GC content or any particular codon. And it probably has to do with secondary structure, although we haven't rigorously proven that. But we've ruled out a few things. So that was a little, a little bit of discussion of DNA chip libraries. But here's some examples of some successes. So the first thing we did with the chip libraries in 2004 was we assembled operons, essentially uh, ribosomal operons. Uh, so it was essentially a gene assembly since then, um, uh, Elledge and Hannon have sh uh, short hairpin RNAi, and many since then um, targeted sequencing where you can do uh, hybridization selection, barcodes, epitopes, and guide RNAs. But what's, what we're really pushing for now is not each of those libraries, you typically do one thing at a time. Uh, you'll, you may do 100,000 in the library, but each cell gets one of them, and that makes it a clean experiment. But we're getting more and more interested in, in combinations where we might do um, two, three, four, five, seven, many combinations at once. So I showed you one already where we were looking at transcription and translation regulatory elements in PNS and science. And then uh, this recoding, I started to talk with that. Um, we've done um, uh, around up to six uh, transcription factors at once. We have, I think, the the most comprehensive set of transcription fa human transcription factors, uh, which is still not quite complete. And then, uh, and then the classic one that, that kind of illustrates how important this is, is the Yamanaka factors, uh, where you needed four at once. You couldn't get it by with one at a time. We're making organoids uh, of various sorts. We're most, I think, obsessed with hippocampus because of its role in memory and in Alzheimer's. Um, but we're aiming for these kind of pyramidal cells and, and uh, interesting structures. And what we do is we want to compare our organoid with a natural structure and see all the differences at very, with a very rich and detailed subcellular localization of the RNAs and proteins. So in order to do that, we developed this method um, starting in, in the 1990s, I'm embarrassed to say. We started developing physique and uh, fluorescent C2 sequencing. These are two uh, cells uh, that where each dot is a separate uh, RNA molecule that's been lightly amplified, circularized, cDNA made circularized, lightly amplified, very lightly, so that each dot is still below the resolution of the microscope. The bright sections tend to be the nuclei. And it's put into a hydrogel here. So back in 1999, the hydrogel we use is polyacrylamide. Uh, for this experiment, it was uh, polyethylene glycol, and for ones I'll mention in a moment, is polyacrylate. Um, so polyacrylamide, PEG, polyacrylate. And, uh, and this was uh, Jay Lee, who's now at Cold Spring Harbor, and Evan Doherty, who's still a graduate student in the lab, uh, pioneered this, uh, at least the last phase of it. They weren't around in 1999. And uh, we've, we're improving, let's see. Uh, here's an example of a, qual a quality control where we uh, took a fairly large messenger RNA, fibronectin, in a uh, fibroblast model uh, of wound healing. So you scrape through the fibroblasts and you change the media to uh, have epidermal growth factor. And this is a histogram of all the, all the reads uh, along the messenger RNA on the x-axis. The length is about 8 kb, which is fairly large messenger RNA. And so every, every place you find a gap, the most noticeable gap, which included an entire exon, exon 25, 
uh, caused, since we were new to this, it caused us to uh, worry that maybe we had some artifact where a particular exon would be uh, underrepresented or missing. Um, fortunately, in the second half of the experiment where we changed the media, that exon came back um, or came uh, for the first time. And uh, it was, uh, turns out, an example of, of alternative splicing. So this in situ sequencing has, uh, you know, all the advantages of conventional sequencing. You can detect, in principle, alternative splicing, RNA editing, and polymorphisms we've detected uh, as well. But in addition to all that you get from normal, say, normal single cell sequencing, you retain, you retain the full three-dimensional coordinates. So you get subcellular information and and multicellular inter information, like how the cells relate to one another in space. So that three-dimensional information is lost in, in conventional single-cell sequencing, and we think it's quite important, especially in cancer and neurobiology, which are some of the main applications. So we do, uh, we're, we're aiming for now multiple identifying, uh, these, are, these are just little tags, so we don't have to sequence the whole RNA from end to end, but we have to have tags. We'd like to have multiple tags per RNA, and we'd like to extend this from, from RNA, which we've published two papers on, to R DNA, RNA, and protein, and maybe small molecules. And we do this, we have to, exp we have to get, uh, pack more reads into a cell. And so one disadvantage relative to the conventional way where you spread all the RNAs out, uh, you, you lose the 3D information, but you get to spread them out over a big area. Um, we need to somehow, um, pack that into the size of the cell. So one way to do that is uh, improve the resolution so the cell is broken up into a larger number of pixels or voxels. Or the other, which I think is quite clever from the Boyden group, is actually expanding the cell um, uh, so that it becomes now an easier problem. And uh, in, his, in, his, in their first science paper, which I'll show in a moment, they got a 4.5-fold expansion in, in each dimension isotropically. And uh, cubed, that's, that's about a hundred fold. And then you can do that two or three times, uh, getting basically as much expansion as you want. I'll show you that. So this is from, uh, we're, we've been collaborating with Ed on this and, and a number of other projects for, <clears throat> for years. Um, in this particular case, he, he, the science paper was focused on proteins which were recognizable by antibodies. So this little Y-shaped molecule is a primary antibody binding to the purple protein, and then a secondary antibody binding to it, and a secondary antibody is labeled oligonucleotides, um, which can, these oligonucleotides can now bind to this matrix. Remember I said it's all in a hydrogel matrix, originally polyacrylamide in the 90s, then PEG, and now polyacrylate. And uh, when it binds, to, when it covalently binds to polyacrylate, uh, you can now digest away all the protein and wash out all the fluorescent background, and you're left with a very clean uh, po polymer, polyacrylate, and whatever nucleic acid and fluorophores you want. So you can, polyacrylate being a polyanion, uh, when you reduce the salt, it will, it will repul the, the negative charges will repulse, and it just expands by 4.5 fold in every direction. Um, and you can see it's very uh, isotropic. So this is a comparison of a one kind of super resolution where you just fix and, and, uh, and analyze, and the other one you expand. And so you can see the expansion is, this expansion one is isotropic and fairly faithful, at least at the resolutions we've looked at so far. And so you can show that you can do this at, at large scale, so you get the whole context of this whole uh, hippocampal multi-layer going from the granule layer all the way through CA1 layers and you can trace <clears throat> the connectome here and and you can since you're looking at proteins you can even determine the polarity and the type of synapse you have here you have two different uh, a presynaptic and postsynaptic protein labeled in red and blue um, this, is, this is all in their first paper and uh, and we're working with them have been working with them on various aspects of neurobiology now this is our biggest view, and we're almost uh, ready for questions here, so start storing up your questions. This is our biggest uh, ambition for the neurobiology, which is to not just measure one type very well in one uh, cell or a few cells, but to integrate all these different things. So we want to be able to measure activity 
um, behavior connectome, that is to say, that what I just showed in the previous slide, which neuron synapses with which neuron, thousands of, of synapses per neuron, the developmental lineage, that is which cell begat which cell uh, <clears throat> during from stem cells all the way up from the zygote, in fact, the entire developmental lineage of the, of the animal, and then expression. Uh, this is related to activity, this expression of RNA, uh, but there are many other. So you want to integrate these into one brain, which we call the Rosetta brain, um, and, and Adam Marblestone and, uh, and others in our group have published a few papers in these prominent journals, our archive and bioarchive, uh, which I urge you to, to publish in as well. This is, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to make a quick uh, an analogy or anti-analogy between nanopores, which is a kind of an esoteric and until recently not so promising sequencing method uh, that we've been working on since the early 1990s. Now there are two companies, Genia acquired by Roche and Oxford Nanopore, both of which are very healthy uh, technologies and, and financially. Uh, the Oxford Nanopore now has a 500 kilobase read length, which I think is the record for any sequencing method and fairly high um, consensus fidelity. The Genia has the advantage of having really high parallelism up to 128,000 pores per chip, and that will be scaling up probably to 8 million pores, and it could probably scale up to billions since it's not limited by light. Anyway, that's reading, that's basically, I'm not going to go into detail, but that's reading from, that's taking DNA and turning it into something that modulates the ion current going through a, a, a pore. The alternative and this is some data from it showing that you can distinguish here runs of bases with the Genia method, uh, you know, G's in a row, A's in a row, T's, um, where these are the four G's in a row, G, 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 oops, G, 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 and then A, 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 T, 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 with a false positive here. So anyway, that, that's going from DNA to conductance. The alternatives go to conductance to DNA. Uh, this, is the, this is the whole reading and writing biology. We would like to be able to, to turn each uh, activity map uh, of each neuron into something that is compact, um, where it can be stored until we're ready to do serial section and do the whole Rosetta brain thing, where we look at transcriptome and connectome, in this case, activity. So we, we're, we've pursued about five different ways, I'm just going to go through one of them, of encoding um, activity information into nucleic acids. And this one, we have DNA polymerases, which are almost every DNA polymerase is differentially susceptible to cations. Uh, in this case, we have calcium, manganese, and magnesium, sodium. We have a bunch of cations at once, and you can show that calcium uh, changes the misincorporation of a G here opposite a T, so that's a not a Watson Creek base pair. It changes the misincorporation quite significantly in a physiological range between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the 2 micromolar. Uh, oh, I said I was only going to mention one, but here's another one that is CRISPR related. This is the CRISPR that nobody talks about. This is how I, most people talk about CRISPR as a nuclease, given that you're giving it the guide RNA. But in, in the wild, uh, it, it first has to make the guide RNAs from the phages that are infecting the cell. It's a phage resistance mechanism. And so we, we're trying to harness that to encode the, uh, the, the time sequence of messenger RNAs that occur in a neuron. And I said that we, with this in situ method, we can detect DNA, RNA, and protein. Uh, I've really only given you an example of, of RNA and protein, um, but there's a very active community looking at ways of tracing the chain of the chromosome so you actually get a true three-dimensional structure uh, of the chromosomes at high resolution, including the Wu lab and the um, Peng Yin and, and Xiao Wei Zhuang's lab. But we'd also like to do metabolomics in C2, and this is, we have two different ways of doing sensor selectors or s coupling sensor to various uh, output media. This is one of them using allosteric DNA binding proteins, and the other one is using protein degradation, which is stabilized by the targets. And here's some data, a synthetic, a really synthetic sensor of progesterone that graduate student Justin Fang and colleagues worked on. So uh, that's the end of this little hectic tour. Uh,
hopefully I've been provocative enough that you have some questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I really like the idea behind trying to re-engineer the amino acid code so that you can engineer viral resistance. But don't you think viruses are a bit smarter than us and they will probably eventually evolve and adapt to these new synthetic amino acids if they become more abundant in the environment? Yeah, that, that's certainly a testable hypothesis. I can tell you why it is that we might be a little arrogant on this uh, point. I mean, it, it, you're, you're right, uh, you know, the Jurassic Park uh, life will find a way. Uh, the reason is that, uh, so if you, um, I mean, first of all, we already got some impact with a very unlikely codon, which is the, the UAG stop codon. But more importantly, if you, if, if you look at the seven codons we're doing next, and you calculate the number of those that occur in essential viral genes, so almost every, almost every gene is essential in a virus, but if you look at the number that would have to change simultaneously <clears throat> to accommodate it is vast. And if you get to that high a level of mutagenesis, then you'll be hitting, uh, there'll be other things that are being mutated. That, so, so anyway, they, viruses never run into this in the wild. Usually <clears throat> uh, there's coevolution of the host and the virus. The virus is constantly catching up. But here you take the whole thing offline, you make fundamental changes in the host that, and then put it back. So anyway, it, it, we, we will be testing it soon. We've collected lots, you know, E. coli, for better, for, from bad from a biotechnology standpoint, it has a lot of phages. Uh, uh, good from standpoint of testing this hypothesis, and so we'll we'll find out. But I'm pretty confident. It's, it's not really a question. I was quite intrigued by this pig example. So you are removing essentially all the active transposable elements in a living pig. Yes. And so far, living pig cells. Okay. And so, in terms of evolutionary impact of transposons on genome, stuff like genome evolution and so on, I mean, I find it a fascinating experiment. So, is there anything else you can sort of share with us? Right. So, I'll just repeat the question or reframe it. Uh, so, so, so uh, uh, I just casually said that we knocked out the retroviruses for the for a practical reason, which is that everybody was scared of them getting into, I didn't fully flesh it out, they were scared about that an immune compromised patient that's accepting the Zeno transplant, uh, they would just take off, fill up the patient and then mutate to become even more human uh, infective. It's already known that these pig retroviruses will infect human cells and then, and then they'll inf keep infecting. So that was the reason given, um, but, th but the other reason I've been trying to, uh, so I don't tell my lab what to do, I just kind of uh, request. Uh, so I've been requesting for about a decade that we try to knock out the retroviruses because it's not known, what, they, 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 they hop around a lot during development, especially brain development, and it's not known whether they are deleterious or helpful to development or neutral. And it's hard to test that without knocking them all out. I mean, that's, that's and you want to do it very carefully because the LTRs of the viruses might have some promoter activity. You just want to stop them from hopping. And so that's what we did is we, we made a fairly subtle but irreversible change in the polymerase gene of all these copies so that we won't hop but they still have all the cis-regulatory elements in place. And, and then once we get into pigs, then we'll see whether we'll give them behavioral and cognitive tests to make sure that they're still smart pigs. Now, there's a safety issue here. If they turn out that they're really smart pigs, then, we, <laughs> then we're in trouble. Um, so I, I'm, my question relates to a ticker tape idea. Uh, so you, presumably there's a trade-off between the temporal resolution of whatever signal you're trying to read out of from the one or right and, and the fidelity and error rate. Do you, do you have not levers for which you can play with that? And do you have a sense of, you know, are there any sort of, you know, Sound sound barrier type sort of hard stops where this technology sort of will not get us to. So, so, so just reframing the question, it, it, in the ticker tape, it, is there a trade-off between uh, fidelity and temporal resolution, say, um, and are the knobs that you can twist? 
it's it's very early stage. So we, we plan to have knobs we can twist, but and and we do. We can we 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 play with the which polymerase it is and which cations we're using and so forth. But uh, most of these experiments are very very primitive. Um, there's a, in addition to that trade off, uh, there's a trade off of time versus resolution. So we can do a longer recording. Uh, at lower resolution, and for some purposes, that might it, we might actually want to do something like instead of looking at the fastest action potentials with sodium and potassium, we might want to look at slower ones like calcium because they've actually the cell has done some integration for us, or maybe even slower like the intermediate early RNA response to the calcium, because then we can look at a higher level of of, of neuronal integration. So. Doing this, the, the slow response times is not necessarily a bad thing, and we might want to have longer readouts. But anyway, it, I, I want to leave you the impression that this is very, we have four different methods, very cru all of them very crude uh, level of development, and we invite anybody to, to join us or think of new ways of doing it. But I, 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 we became convinced, one of the papers on the physics of the brain activity map, it becomes quite convincing. If you want to measure every neuron, which may be a little too uh, aggressive, but if you did, uh, it's it's hard to do that with electrodes or almost any other physics-based method. So synthetic biology is extremely compact; it's about a million times more compact. Your recording experiments with the genetic code were there any results, be maybe negative results, maybe the ones you didn't even report, that essentially would enlighten? Uh, uh, the forces, the evolutionary forces that have actually led to the development of the code as we know it. So now you're essentially changing it organism-wide. Is there anything where you could start speculating about some of the theories that have actually led to it uh, 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 to begin with? It, it, uh, and its universality as such. So we're learning a lot of biology. I, I don't think we're ideally positioned to learn that sort of stuff because right now we're dealing with such a mature um, ribosome and translation system that we're really dealing with putting out fires that we create that are heavily overlaid with regulatory secondary structure and, and so forth. I think that there are some uh, theoretical work in literature which I find quite compelling where they look at the, the probability of transitioning to an amino acid that's similar in function and that indicates that the code we have is close to one in a million level of, of optimality, which would argue that the code was not a frozen accident, but it, that there's actually a, quite a bit of optimization that occurred before it got locked in. Um, so that's not so our work. the question is about the forces that, that led to this optimization. What was optimized? Right? I, I think that at least one of the things in the literature uh, not, is that it was, uh, you wanted it to be robust to mutation. Um, now, for biotechnology, you might want it to be fragile to uh, mutation. You want it to lock, you want it to do what you want it to do, and you don't want it to go mutating off. Uh, so you, you might want it to break every time it mutates. Um, so what we want is not necessarily what evolution wanted. But I think the sort of thing we're learning is more about all these complicated, overlapping uh, regulatory elements, and, and we're lucky that they're not more of them, because if there were enough of them, then this would be, would be a very difficult project, yeah. See, so maybe we to, we'll talk about it tomorrow, but how far along are we from launching a, a, ma a major project using gene drive to, to solve a major healthcare problem such as malaria? Like, what are the, what are the obstacles in the way? Well, I, I, there, well so uh, we have uh, CRISPR working in Anopheles gambii, which is the mate, I mean, there's, there's about 60 different species that have small effects, but the Anopheles has the biggest impact. Uh, so we have CRISPR working. We don't yet have a fully functional gene drive. Uh, the Gates Foundation is interesting supported. It, it's, not, uh, it's not actually likely to be commercially uh, successful. Because there, is, there is a company in this field called Oxitec that makes sterile males by genetics. And that's a good business model because it doesn't work. And so you have to come back and do it again. I mean, it doesn't completely work, right? It just, it, knocks them down rather than knocks them out. This will spread and, and, and that'll be it, game over. And so then there's no, there's no recurring financial reward. So I think that that is something that you really need a foundation like the Gates Foundation to support. Then, then you also have to convince uh, the local governments, and I think they're, they're pretty excited about it, but you need to also 
since the mosquitoes don't re respect boundaries, you have to kind of convince everybody. So it might be a U United Nations level decision. But if you're very convinced, you may as well do it, right? You, you just go down, put the flies out, and... Yeah, and it might be the last experiment I ever do. <laughs> no, I think you want to convince everybody else. It, even though it sounds really hard, it's, uh, it's worth doing. I mean, almost everything we do has some kind of uh, ethics and, and safety and security. We, we actually, a lot of our technology is aimed at safety and security. Um, it, it takes a little longer. But it seems to take longer, but actually the thing that takes longest is when you have a setback. Um, like, you know, the three deaths at the beginning of gene therapy were not, you know, it was like three out of 20. That was not good. I'm just worried that in a couple of years, people will do that in the garage. Mm. Yes, you should be. I'm, I, I worry about a lot of things, and that's one of them. Uh, in particular, um, CRISPR is cheap enough. I mean, you can get a CRISPR lab going for about 100 bucks, uh, assuming you have, you know, you make, make centrifuges out of drills, apparently. Uh, um, and then CRISPR gene drive is not much, not much additional effort. And almost everybody has some species they don't like. Uh, and they're not, <laughs> you know, it might be, you know, spiders or scorpions or, you know, dogs or cats. And pretty soon you're left with, uh, with one species, uh, hopefully, humans. Uh, <laughs> I mean, hopefully not that, that you end up with, keep all the species. Well, uh, I guess koala would be left too. Right. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe somebody doesn't like koala. <laughs> okay, no, with the, no accounting for tastes. Yeah. With that note, let's thank uh, George Church again for coming.